panel is chaired by John McEwen, the chair of the FEI Veterinary Committee. John, please. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll just introduce the panel that we have for you and explain the format that we're going to use for this session. Um, the science has been presented today um, uh, and has been of great interest. Um, it's always important to raise the level of understanding, and I hope that's what we've done today, both about the NSAID debate and about the analytical issues that surround this particular debate. Um, we must realize that the science is important and must be sound, but those involved in the sport uh, must make the ethical decisions uh, based upon the science. Now we have a panel who are going to, I'm going to give them each two minutes just to express their view on the topic that we have to discuss, which is the different approaches to non-steroidals usage in FEI competitions. Um, and then we'll take questions from the floor. I have a few questions from the box. Some of your questions from the box, I'm afraid, were for sessions uh, before our session and are way below, below, above our pay grade as far as the science is concerned. So I'll start at the far end. We have uh, Professor Yves Rossier. Um, he's Professor of Equine... <laughs> oh, he's not at the far end. <laughs> okay. How did you get there? <laughs> They swap places. Right, okay, we'll start at the far end. Yogi Breisner is professor of absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, he is an Olympian. Uh, um, he rode for Sweden in Los Angeles, and he won a team gold eventing at the European Championships in 83. He's a fellow of the British Horse Society. He's uh, coached many teams. He's coached the Spanish team. Uh, and he is the performance manager and national coach for eventing under the world-class uh, program uh, for the British Equestrian Federation. Um, next to Yogi, we have Professor Yves Rosier, who is Professor of Equine Sports Medicine from the Montreal University. Um, he was a re did a residency at New Bolton. Um, he is uh, one of the many scientists on, on our committee, veterinary committee. Uh, he has great experience at FEI level, uh, attending as a veterinary delegate um, in many disciplines. Next to him, we have, um, uh, we, we, we have uh, a, a rider who had a very famous father, so it says here. Um, <laughs> who is a multi-gold medalist, uh, sorry, he's a gold medalist at the Athens Olympics. Team bronze medalist in uh, 96. I mean, there's so many medals here, it's unbelievable. Um, he won the World Championships in Rome in 88, which I remember. Um, he won the World Cup uh, three years in a row, which takes a lot of doing, in my opinion. 80, 98, 99, and 2000, I think. Um, he is uh, president of the International Jumpers Riding uh, Club and has been so since uh, 2007. Uh, and next to him, we have an old friend of mine, Philippe Benoit. Uh, Philippe is a sports medicine specialist. Um, he, um, his thesis was on uh, orthopedic treatment in laminitis. Uh, uh, he did an MS in uh, nutrition and equi equine physiology. He was a French team vet for many years. He's been consulted by a number of teams and individuals. Um, he runs a sports medicine and imaging clinic um, and was uh, a member of my committee on the ITVA when we first formed it. And finally, uh, on my right, uh, there's a dressage rider, and it says here, I am the greatest dressage <laughs> rider in the world. <laughs> do, you, do you want my glasses? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, probably the most famous dressage. <laughs> there you are. Come on, let's yeah. go. Let's okay. He's, a, he's, he's fairly ancient. He's been at three Olympic Games as a competitor. Um, he uh, is a team captain for the British Dressage team who won bronze medal in the Europeans in Windsor. Um, he is an individual, uh, sorry, he's a European silver and bronze medalist. Uh, he's been a member of the FEI Dressage Committee. Um, he has been former vice president of the International Dressage Riders Club. I notice he's been a lot of former things. I'm not quite sure what he is now. Richard. 
Okay, well, we'll start with Yogi. Um, Yogi, could you please just give us your viewpoint on A, what you've heard today, and your viewpoint upon the approach to non-steroidals in competition? Great, thank you very much, John, and um, uh, it's nice to be here, and it's been very interesting to listen to all the comments that has come out so far. Um, I have no figures, no statistics, no um, research at all behind my thoughts, uh, only a, a rather long and uh, uh, life with horses. And I would be a liar to say that from my position, at first as a rider and then as a coach, there hasn't been times when you have stood down the last day at a long competition and you haven't wanted to give the horse something to help him along when he might have come out a little bit stiff, had a knock, or just showing a little bit of wear from you know, a, a long competition. And I'm sure that it would be the same in any of the disciplines, particularly when you're doing it over several days as we are doing in eventing. To me, that's no difference really to if I've had a fall and you, know, you wake up in the morning and you're very stiff and you can't wait to have that first little pill down your throat in order to limber up and get a bit of oil into your body. A lot have been talked about here about the ethics and the welfare uh, with horses and I'm sure that we all have the horses welfare at heart because we wouldn't be in this sport if we didn't love and cherish and respect the horse as an individual. And um, having thought hard about it and come in here I'd like to think with a very very open mind and like to be persuaded one way or the other. I think there is one area which maybe has been left out a little bit even though it has been mentioned and that is also the sport and the image of the sport and what we try to create as far as a so-called level playing field is concerned. And I haven't actually heard anything here so far today from the uh, research base on, on the uh, uh, NSAIDs that actually to me reassures me that we are going to create a level playing field with the use uh, or non-use of, of the the steroids. Um, the, I was old enough to remember when our future solidin was allowed to be used and I'm not sure that when they were used that there were more welfare to horses in those days to when they actually took them away. I think that there are other maidens and things have moved on and also the other worry I have by reintroducing it is again listening to all the researchers that come out with the various levels and the testing, etc., are we maybe opening a door for we are going to have more and more competitions decided weeks after they are finished in the courtrooms, in the labs, etc. Um, we have been going for a long time without uh, NSAIDs, and personally, I have, as I said, I haven't seen a decline in horses' welfare since they were taken away. I'm still uh, having an open mind about it. Uh, but at the moment, um, my main concern is that uh, it would be very difficult to write the rules and police and guard the rules if you reintroduce the NSAIDs into the sport so that you actually created a level playing field for the participants. Thank you, Yogi. Uh, Philip, would you like to give us your opinion? You're an experienced show jumping vet who's been around the block for a long time. Okay. Um, well, I guess I would follow kind of the same uh, feeling today. Um, we have learned a lot this morning. Unfortunately, as practitioners, we still have always the same problem to deal between the owners, the clients, the riders, who have putting some pressure on their back. Uh, in my proper experience, I must say that since I have more uh, gray hair on my head, it's easier for me to say to a client, this horse should not compete even though I have some colleagues who have a hard time to say so, I guess, just because they are maybe younger or under the pressure of these people there, and uh, they are maybe leaded to come to use some drugs, which are not always NSAIDs. And in my opinion today, the use of NSAIDs is definitely something we would have liked maybe to use, uh, or maybe keep in a sport in the 1993 just to keep these horses maybe restoring or having a better time after competition, not before competition. I am really sure that I don't want to change the playing field as well. But uh, I would uh, say that if the horse is not responsible of or acts, not responsible of what we choose for him, he's not also choosing to compete. 
I mean, most of the horses, I guess, would prefer to go uh, graze in the field instead of compete sometimes. But at some stage, as vets, we have to do our job. We have to um, maintain the horse in the sport, if he can go in the sport, but not to uh, f uh, all prices. I don't want to get the horse absolutely in the ring, uh, personally, for sure. And I would hope that everyone share the same opinion. So today, my feeling is um, I am very, very uh, spooky about the fact that NSAIDs would go back in a sport if we don't have a very clear rule. Because as we discussed with other colleagues today, um, we come to a point where media has a huge, huge uh, impact on uh, the world public. And uh, according to the welfare of the horse, we have to be very careful of the rules we will pick up at the end of this meeting or FEI will pick up at some stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rodrigo, would you like to just uh, put your point of view? Yes, I will try to keep it very, very short. Um, for one reason is that uh, I'm uh, nowhere as competent as all the participants that have uh, spoken this, mo this morning and this afternoon. Uh, I'll give you the point of view, my point of view as a rider is that we would like to jump with horses that are fit to compete, namely in particular with horses that are not under the effect of substances that could modify their performances in competition. We think we should be able to help our horses when necessary, but how do we do that in a safely and respectful way to our horses? Caring for uncomfort is a basic element of care that we have had to struggle with for a long time. Treating a small problem can very well help us to avoid more aggressive and invasive treatment. Without a sound and a happy horse, I know I cannot have success in the ring, and I also know that most of the riders take better care of their horses than they do of themselves. I hope that with all the experts that are here, we will find a solution that gives us priority to the sport and the welfare of the horse. Thank you. Uh, Richard, do you want to? Um... Um, yeah, uh, I come as a simple rider, and I've found the uh, talks today, especially on science, uh, very challenging, but also very interesting. Um, and I have, obviously, international dressage horses, but I also have show jumpers as well, which compete <laughs> under national rules, and nationally we are allowed to use. Uh, Butte. So I'm used to working, if you like, on, on both those systems. But today, my take on what I've heard today is, uh, I'm afraid without a doubt, the science has been really interesting, but I realize that you science guys have still got a long way to go before you can reach conclusion. Um, in order to really satisfy somebody like me, as that the welfare of the horse and the welfare of our sport is in fact going to be protected by implementing this sort of rule internationally. Uh, we've heard about all the variables, and they concern me an awful lot. We've heard about variables uh, with the non-steroidals themselves, the combinations, uh, variables at the time of ad administration, the condition of the horse, the age of the horse, weight of the horse, the condition of the hydration of the horse. Uh, so obviously the, there are many factors to take into account and, and I took the point that it is not a question of one size fits all. The, the st studies you've shown us, um, I think from what I understand, mostly are treadmill studies and I would like as a rider to have much more evidence and data from field studies uh, before I could make a judgment that we wouldn't be putting our horses or our sport at risk. Dressage is itself very varied. It, we have world breeding championships for five and six-year-old horses. We have FEI pony competitions, young rider, and then obviously we have very strenuous Grand Prix level competitions. They themselves take place in variable conditions, environments, climates. Um, and so I think that as a, as a horseman, well, first of all, just to conclude that, I, th I think for me, from what I've heard today, the science needs to go further to, to convince me uh, uh, that we should take this move. And I don't think we can make this decision just on the science, although obviously we've got to go tomorrow. Uh, as a horseman, I have to ask myself, how do I value 
and appreciate the signs and the early signs of injury, especially inflammation and pain. And I think that that's really, from our point of view, that is the judgment that we make. Um, today, obviously, has been based with world experts uh, giving their, their views. What worries me is that let's look at the repercussions that something like this might have. Would it, is there a danger that this could give the green light to non-experts increasing the use of these non-steroidals? I'm thinking here professional grooms, riders such as myself, without it being under veterinary guidance. And for me, this is very, very important. Um, if that would be the case, uh, and, and uh, I'm talking about obviously out of competition use, and I realize that goes on at the moment, but what I'm saying is that would this, would this endorse that, the use of this in out of competition, then I think that could actually backfire on horse welfare. So I'm concerned about the misuse of these drugs by non-experts, by non-vets, because they're not, they're not under prescription. They're not only available from vet, vets. You can get these drugs anywhere. Um, and I also wonder about the vulnerability of competition vets. How do you know uh, when horses arrive at competition what their current threshold is? Contamination, uh, and I will be finishing soon, but I, I feel this is... <laughs> Very, very important. Contamination at FEI level is not good enough yet. We, unlike racing, we put horses in bedding that has been used by national horses the day before, that has been used from the previous show. And it's a huge risk. And we've heard today about the risk of contamination from the, some of these substances. And that, I, my question is, could that just tip a threshold level over the edge. I think threshold levels of, as a rider are very dangerous and are very imprecise. It's, we, we have a threshold level in England for drinking and driving. And I think that's a very dodgy uh, situation to be because we know the variables uh, with human beings. Um, so I, my view is I think that we have a very long way to go and we need a lot more information about this and we will need to look at our disciplines and see how we would split those up. Is it right that we, in dressage, for instance, would have a, this would apply to all horses? What about the breeding championship? For, what about using this for five and six-year-olds? It's not quite the same as giving it to an older horse, perhaps. And so I think, uh, I think we've got a long way to go before I could be convinced that this would be a good move all round. Thank you. I thought I was going to stop you before you got into tomorrow's topics. Um, <laughs> In fact, I think you've dealt with three of them, so we'll have a shorter day tomorrow. That's just, that's just fine. Um, Eve, would you like to... Um... Thank you, John. I'll um, speak here as an FEI veterinary delegate. Um, and, of course, my primary concern when I speak like that is of horses' well-being. My, my two main roles as an FEI veterinary delegate is ensure a horse's well-being and maintenance of an even playing field. Now, to me, included in um, horses' well-being is to make sure that I can not provide, but make sure they get the best possible care, not only in terms of veterinary care, but we include in there stabling, feed, exercise areas. Um, and we know how to treat. I want to make sure they have treatment abilities for the conditions that might occur during a competition. Right now, we, we have protocols for certain situations, such as fever, colic, uh, the gastric ulceration syndrome, um, and those are part of the best care we can give um, to the horses. Now, uh, to, we've talked about this possible administration of NSAIDs today, and I, to me, um, I have certain criteria I'd like to know before I can, you know, say that it's acceptable to me. So first of all, it needs to be safe in terms of non-toxicity. Um, as opposed to necessarily its secondary effect, but it has to be non-toxic. It absolutely must not be hiding pain at the time of competition, and I'll include in there, obviously, horse inspections, I'll say at the time of performance. So I do not want to think that the horses competing or presented at a horse inspection have a modification in their um, clinical signs of pain. It must not enhance performance. And to me, that's very clear that it's by another mechanism that the, the effect of the medication. So, and I think um, 
that they should not improve horses' performance beyond their um, basic ability. And thirdly, uh, and I'll refer to you, you um, uh, Richard, refer to that as well. I think these treatments must be administered by a veterinarian with following a diagnosis. This is one very important principle of a protocol like we've spoken about. Now, after today's presentation, I, uh, the safety issue, I, I, I think we've, we're fairly comfortable that we're okay on that one. I'm not so confident, and I hear conflicting results on the pain um, issue and on the performance enhancement issue. Um, and obviously, the veterinarian issue is one that we can work through with the protocols, etc. cetera. Um, I come from a country and a continent, North America, that has far looser protocols for the non-steroidal usage at the national level, so probably feel safer in terms of the potential side effects, et cetera, as we have been using them for a long time in, in competition horses with, with less control and less protocol that is suggested for uh, the discussions we've had today. Thank you. Actually, before I ask for questions, I'll, I'll ask you a question. You've mentioned protocols. How, do you, how have, you, have you found the new protocols for treatment? Um, um, and how do you find the LIST system is settling in? Do you find it helpful? Do you find the system working well? How do you find the system overall? Uh, yeah, well, that's an excellent question. We've had the LIST um, system in existence since April 5, um, and I think it's still in a varied stage in, in or variable situations, but I think overall, the overall effect is a positive one and of, of openness, of discussion with treatment veterinarians, with, with competitors. Um, and I would certainly see this, this NSAID administration fits absolutely into that protocol. I'd like a right of view on the protocol too, so I, I don't know whether which of you would like to com comment. Well, <clears throat> like any new rule, uh, there's a period of, um, of uh, adaptation that needs to be, um, that needs to be in place. Um, surely there was not enough um, education and awareness done before April 5th. It was a kind of a shock uh, when the day arrived and everything started. There was a lot of commotion in the beginning. And we have been very actively talking with the, with the FEI about this and bringing back all the problems that we encountered on the, on the field. Um, but I think this was due to the urgency of, uh, of um, putting the rule out there. But I think that the FEI is, uh, is doing a, a good job to, um, to uh, uh, bring solutions to, uh, to the problems that we encounter every day on the field with the treating vets. Um, but so far, I think that's, that, 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 that's about it, I think. Um, hopefully, um, in the next couple, of, uh, next couple of months, things will run uh, smoothly and uh, we can adapt ourselves to the, to the changes and, uh, and not have to look back on this uh, difficult period that we have been going through the last couple of, uh, last couple of years. Thank you. Richard, do you want to comment? No, I think, I think that main point was that I think we have to have more time for education. I mean, that's really what, let's face it, what this, these two days are all about for everybody, never mind what level of expertise you happen to be at here. Um, but from our point of view, from managing horses, you know, it's got to get down to us and we have to be able to change our systems. And I, I think that should be a lesson that we need more time for these changes. And, well, time for education, really. John, may I? Um, just one thing that I would like to put out onto the floor here, uh, talking as a team manager, and probably Richard very correctly mentioned the bottom end of the, the uh, pyramid, as it were, and all, all the different classes, etc. But at the championship level, from a team manager's point of view, certainly in three-day eventing, and I wouldn't have thought it would be that much difference in the going into the final leg of the show jumping competition or the dressage competition, if there is allowed to be used NSAID 
and that becomes a discretion for the veterinary delegates and the ground jury at that competition to authorize that. That would be a tremendous amount of pressure from the riders to the team managers of the individual teams to get all their horses on NZ leading into the final element of the competition because it would be looked upon as better to have it than not have it. A little bit of help to get that little bit of extra out of them on that final leg on winning those medals. So if we are wanting to create a sport where we will go into the final of the Olympic Games having maybe 70, 80, 90% of the horses on end sets, then please bring it in. If you don't want to create that sport, then please don't bring it in. I fully agree with what Rodrigo was saying about looking after the horses and uh, helping the horses. I do think there are alternatives out there to uh, help horses, particularly if it was, as the present suggestion is, where the talk was that it's a very, very short window that you are actually using it. But all the same, the perception from the majority of riders will be in that final leg, can we have it? And then it becomes a judgment by the ground jury, by the veterinary delegates, who do we give it to, who do we give it to? Why were the Americans allowed to have it? Why couldn't the Germans have it? Why did Germany get three horses to uh, have before it? Before this gets uh, too so nationalistic, I think we'll just pull, <laughs> pull the plug on that. <laughs> um, left can can, can we have a, some that. questions from the floor, please? <laughs> okay, at the back. Yes. It's working? Oh, sorry. I hope that everybody had a nice day. I hadn't, because I heard a lot of bullshit and, and a lot of stupid questions. Uh, Leo, could you say who you are, please, for the record? <laughs> Leo. <laughs> 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 I'm Dr. De Becker. I did several Olympics, and I think uh, I'm already a long time in the sport. I was also with John in the first meeting we had at the time, the first week with the older vets in Den Haag. And there we had the, the same talkings and the same things. So I'm a little bit disappointed today because I think the FEI is there for the horses and the riders and I'm really disappointed that nobody takes a clear point of view because if the FEI is there for the horses, okay, everybody knows, that's the reason why we asked threshold levels already for many years, they never moved, but the FEI is also there for the riders. If you see the, the amount of positive cases where we know from the labs because there is always information leaking out, that a lot of horses were positive with very low amounts, so really rest values from treatments, then I think the FAI has to do something to protect riders and the horses. And I think the first step we have to, to go is the threshold levels. The second reason from this meeting is, of course, what do we have to do in November? Do we have to support for the pro so-called progressive list or do we maintain the zero option? I think, I mean, and okay, I know that this discussion today is especially about non steroidals but I think there are several drugs where we know that there is no real impact on performance and where we can support the health and difficulties from horses during competition in many, in many directions. So I think that we have to stand up and fight for this progressive list because I think we have to do something to give the horses the treatment that they deserve. Thank you. Does anyone want to comment upon that statement? I presume it wasn't a question. Okay. We take another question? Fine. Yes, uh, I'm Yves Bonner, um, lab director of uh, Laboratoire des Courses Hippiques in France. Uh, just a few comments. Um, I fully understand uh, what has been said about uh, low concentration or so-called low concentration. Uh, I think uh, everybody has to understand that the FEI, as well as racing authorities, are fully involved in adopting what we call uh, some sort of decision level. It's called FEI screening limit or international screening limits or whatever. And um, using those screening limits, we can address the problem of irrelevant concentration as well as contamination problem, 
which has been raised uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, and I think uh, it's a much, much, much better solution to address those problems than thresholds, because thresholds have many implications in terms of chale possible challenging, in terms of cost, in terms of laboratory problems, and it's probably not the good solution. Screening limits are surely more flexible approach to, 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 to address those problems. Thank you. Eve, do you want to comment on that? You don't. Well, I would agree with you. <laughs> Good. Yeah, sure. Okay, the problem as a practitioner, we are always between the hammer and the anvil today. Um, at some stage, I have to agree with Leo. some stage, I have to agree with Eve. At the end of the day, someone has to uh, support the cost of everything, especially if we stay in quantitative studies and uh, thresholds. Um, I would mention what uh, Pierre-Louis Toutain has mentioned this morning. I, I completely agree with the risk in the management. Uh, there is a science, what we have spoken this morning about, and there is a management risk that we have to face if we agree about using NSAIDs. I guess, why do we use NSAIDs as vets, or why we, uh, would we use NSAIDs? If these horses do sheep in a bad way, if these horses get stable in a bad way, if these horses leave unsound the stable where they are trained to arrive in a place where they are, they are going to show, for sure they are going to remain unsound. There is no miracle in between the time they get in the truck and the time they get off the truck to be further better. So my point is to have, again, a better education with all the colleagues, a better follow-up with all the vets involved in all the high-level <laughs> Uh, with all the high-level competitors. If we do so, if we can have a much better education, we should not have uh, to use these drugs. We should not have to abuse, as some people would say, about these drugs. We just would have to use these drugs at the proper time in accordance with the FER rules, in accordance with the FEI vets, which are not uh, cr crazy people. They have done studies as well. We can discuss. And since the April 5, since we have this progressive list, since we have this treatment box, we are able today to have a much better communication and hopefully we can treat horses on time when they get there, especially if we have an emergency uh, reason for that. Thank you. Um, I have a question. <clears throat> okay. Um, could I ask on a, a matter of clarification? Um, we've heard a lot of talk about a level playing field. I'm here. Sorry. All right. Sorry. 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 <laughs> I can see you in the lights there. It's, it's, I was you're, hiding. You're coming out of the lights. <coughs> at me there. Um, it's just on, on, on an issue of clarification. Uh, we hear a lot of talk of the phrase a level playing field. Um, what does the FEI mean by level playing field? Do, does that mean all horses on no medication? That's a level playing field. Or does it mean all horses on a threshold of butte? Um, as was correctly pointed out here by the speaker, uh, if there is a threshold of butte, everybody will want some because that way they're on a level playing field. So I'd like to know what, what exactly is meant by the level playing field. Yogi, you mentioned a level playing field. Would you like to define it? Well, I don't know what the FEI stand on it is, but uh, that was my whole point about saying that we are all either wanting to be on it or we are all going to want to be off it. And um, then, of course, it, it becomes a, a, a judgment. I think that you could argue that point with all sort of medication that is allowed or, or not allowed. We talked about temperatures and antibiotics and all those sorts of things. But the fact is that those are there to, to treat a specific condition in the horse, whilst with the uh, NSAIDs, you are, yes, that might be something specific to horses, bang the knee and so on, but we're also talking about helping the horse along, generally speaking, from a little bit of stiffness, from, you know, an ongoing thing that might come through town wear over a long period of time, etc. And uh, if you are then, um, to me, it becomes very important that if you are going to allow it, the rules get written in such a way that you are not, you are not going to be able to get an advantage one way or the other. Yes, you talked about giving it 12 hours before, but if you have, for example, you know, a three-day event, someone might be doing cross-country at 10 o'clock in the morning. 
So then you would want to do that treatment if it's going to be in the horse's best interest immediately after he's finished the cross country, which puts him well in the window of the 12 hours before he trots up at 8 o'clock the following morning. But the one that does cross country at 4 in the afternoon, he's going to be much, much closer to that deadline. And as we have shown, you know, it comes, it was said it's out of the system after six, or the effect is diminished after six hours. Yeah, but it doesn't stop after six hours. There is still a little bit of a uh, tapering away. And all these things, to me, will be perceived as that, you know, if I have my cross country early, then the ones that are later on are closer to that time. And to me, it opens a whole area of things that is finding it difficult. And likewise, I mean, we're all talking about trying to be upfront about things, but we have these rules and regulations because there are small percentage out that are going to try to push these rules to the limit. Now, if you have been allowed to be given that and you have a threshold of things and you get your permission by the veterinary delegates, you get, get it given, what's to stop you to administer some more later on, hoping that you're going to be inside the threshold? And if you are, then you might get away with having a slightly higher level by the time you go to the trot up because you're still inside the level. To me, that is creating an unlevel playing field, if you like. Rodrigo, did you want to make a comment? Yes, um, I think that that's very complicated, 12 hours and here and there and in the middle of the competition and just before the final and this, it, it disturbs me a little bit. I'm more, um, what about Sunday night when everything is finished? and the horse has to travel 10 hours, 12 hours back home and has a couple of days off and light work to ease off a little bit the efforts that he's done during the week. I think that there is less, you're playing less with fire and limit. Uh, if you maybe allow it, um, allow it at the end when everything is finished and that the horse can go home and spend a, a good Sunday night driving and Monday and Tuesday at home recuperating uh, for the next competition, um, from the efforts that he did uh, during the during the last uh, during the last weekend. John, uh, this is Ken Allen from the United States, and uh, I, I wanted to be sure and uh, make a comment and let you know that the United States. Uh, Equestrian Federation's drug and medication program is very serious business, not really cartoonish, and uh, that uh, uh, some of the questions that you all are asking and struggling with can be uh, hopefully helped, not answered, but helped with a program where we have for obviously 42 years had a controlled medication program that had a fixed limit, which we quantify within our laboratory on a regular basis. And to address numerous questions that have been bouncing around, one of them is uh, it is 12 hours prior to competition. We set a level. Uh, all the same things that we've been talking about, moving horses in and out of competition, stalls, that sort of thing, go on on a regular basis here, and yet we don't seem to have problems with a lot of variability and overages set on a quantitative limit. The system works quite well. We do 1.7 million starts last year. Uh, we test 15,000 horses. Uh, of those, about 15, only 15% 15 are on non-steroidals, even though every one of them could be. Um, so there, you know, and it's not a theoretical exercise for us. It is something we practically do every day and have a lot of experience with. And I can tell you the system can work if the FEI chooses to go that direction. There, is, there are models, and it's a workable system. So with that, I would add my comment. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ken. John, I have a question. Can we just let Eve put a response, or was your question? Yes, um, Eve Bonnet again. Uh, yes, Kent, uh, just a, a small, a short comment. Um, 
and you probably know that uh, most of the American labs are spending enormous resources only on controlling the levels for phenylbutazone and have no more resources to do something else. Sorry to say that, but it's a, it's a matter of fact. I'm not saying about all, 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 all the labs. I'm not talking about all the labs, but uh, many labs spend their own resources just to check the level of phenylbutazone. Very few. Well, very few, because we have no, we have no, we have, we have no threshold for that. We have no threshold because uh, you have to know, and you know that that controlling rigorously a threshold uh, demands a lot of money and a lot of work. So uh, it's extremely expensive, and just uh, 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 using some sort of decision limit is completely different. So in Europe, in fact, we are not spending a money, not a euro in really controlling the thresholds of NSIDs, I mean. I, I appreciate that, Even The thing I would tell you is that, which you know, I'll, I'll state it to the rest of the group, is there is an upfront cost involved in this. But once you do the upfront cost, the cost of then going ahead and calculating what that quantitative limit is only on the horses that have non in their system not much, and I know that because we do some testing for the FBI, and I know what we charge them. It isn't much. So, but do you think the labs have enough resources to control very difficult drugs like a growth hormone, EPO, or whatever? And, and we do that as well, as you know. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was a question from the back. Yes, Tim. Tim, Tim Ober from the U.S. Question Federation. I'm, I'm sorry, Tim. It's, it, for us, we haven't got the problem of having to use the remote that doesn't work, but we can't see you because of the lights, so that's fine. Okay. okay. <laughs> Tim Ober from the U.S. Question Federation, team veterinarian for show jumping. Uh, just a quick fact check uh, relative to Dr. Barnard's question. There's only one laboratory in the United States that runs the samples Dr. Allen was referring to. That's the USEF laboratory for sport horses. Understandably, there are various laboratories for racing. Uh, just since that's a state jurisdiction issue. So that might clear up some of that question. Uh, the question posed earlier regarding um, the tendency of, of all riders to want butte when that opportunity exists. I think I want to underscore Dr. Allen's comment of 15, observation of 15% of, of horses competing in the US among all those samples have butte in their system. And I would like for Dr. Rossier to relay that same information from Canada. I think, I think we'll find that it's pretty similar. Yes, it's over the last three years has been between eight and 12% of and samples then, showing one non steroidal. And the only other comment I'd like to add in quickly is that there is an important person in the process that has not been discussed, and that is the team veterinarian or treating veterinarian. We are responsible individuals, and we take this position of acting as the voice for the horse along with the rider in a very serious way. And I think we need to consider that when we're regulating what happens in the barn area. And uh, I, I think I speak for all of us team veterinarians and treating veterinarians when I say that it's a, it's a responsibility we are willing to shoulder in a responsible way and that that should be considered from the regulatory perspective. May I, um, as I was the one that brought up about the riders and um, their will to use it, I'm delighted to hear that that is the percentage that is used. Of course, um, we, you are dealing with national competitions, so you are not dealing with an international competition where the medals are at stake, which I think would put the whole thing into a different perspective on what's being uh, used. Um, only going back, and I have absolutely no statistical figures on it, but in the days when Butte was allowed to be used and there was no testing for it, it used to be common practice going to an international three-day event that you put your horse on Butte a week before you started and you kept it on Butte throughout the competition. 
and in those days, again, I could have no figures whatsoever, but it uh, was a very, very high percentage, I bet. If you go back and ask people who were riding in the 70s and early 80s, you'd say that that was pretty normal in the three-day eventing, for sure. I don't know about the other sports. Uh, John, can I just come in there? Because I'd like to support Yogi on that one. I think, as a rider, that there's a lot... It's a very different uh, pressure... Uh, going to national competitions or even smaller international competitions as opposed to being at the championships of the Olympic Games and the rest of it. And I think we need to think about how this program is going to be separated, how it rolls out to, uh, to competitions around the world of all sorts of different statuses and levels or whether we're only thinking about championship medal competitions. John, can I ask a question from the back because you can't see me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Go for it. <laughs> You're looking in the wrong direction. Tim Morris, British Horse Racing Authority. just like to make it clear that I realise that um, there will be questions about other sports, um, a question in sports tomorrow, um, and, and compliment the FEI for its very robust and open debate on this. We've, we've just heard a, a discussion from the panel about what people think, and Yogi and Rowley have both talked about the image of the sport. And we've talked a lot about the science today, do we really understand what people think? Is it good enough to rely on anecdote, old opinion polls, sensationalist media, uh, what the sponsors are meant to think? Or is there a bit of science that's missing and that would help other sports, other equestrian sports as well as the FEI, which is good social science to really understand what motivates riders, what might motivate riders in different senses, what sponsors and the public really think rather than an opinion poll where you set the question to get the answer or you're relying on a sensationalist journalism. So I was wondering if, in, in the context that we need to do more of the, of the analytical and veterinary science, whether we also need to do some proper social science to understand what people think about how we treat horses. Yes, I, th I think that's a fair point, uh, and all we can do is to ask the riders on the panel and see how they feel about these things, because they are the only riders that we have available with a microphone. Um, but I think looking at that uh, social sciences is a very important issue. S Sorry, who, there's a question in the back, yeah. Yeah, uh, Fleming Winberg, Sweden. Uh, I'm a veterinary surgeon, but I'm also chairman of the Swedish Reining Horse Association. And exactly what was just said is we've been talking about veterinary science. We've been talking about how we as veterinarians are going to treat horses. But what is the public perception? You know, having drugs or treating horses during competition is going to be worse than stopping them into the wall, which people do in my sport. So I would like to hear the riders and Yogi on the panel just tell us a little about their fears of introducing this drug or treatment during competition as opposed to treatment after competition. We'd like to talk first. Um, I mean, I totally agree with what Rodrigo was saying is that, you know, once the competition is finished, if you of course you want to look after the horse and you are doing things to the horse. In eventing we are in the fortunate position in that we don't compete that often. So we can actually take the horse home on the Sunday, give them treatment and then they have a recovery period before they go again. Show jumping, they get home on the Sunday evening and they are off again on the Tuesday night. And obviously if they have helped them then it stays in and I think that is a separate issue that uh, might be able to be tackled. I don't know what the general perspective is of un non question public and, and what their reaction to this is at all. Um, certainly uh, among uh, British vent riders, um, having asked around and sent questionnaires around prior to this, talking about a fairly small number of people um, Will Connor will probably put the figures right on you, but I think we were talking about in the region of um, 40 people being uh, saying no to NZ and about three or four people saying yes. Um, so that's a fairly clear message from riders within Great Britain in the eventing uh, 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 sphere. So I don't know the other figures. If one looks at other sports, where again, and I've taken the the sensational press out of this. Um, you know, if I do look at other 
you know, sport, not talking about all sports, what positive tests and medication and those sort of things have done to sports like cycling, etc. The question is, if we were to introduce the NZ thing, it would, in my opinion, need a very, very clever way of communicating that to the general public so that we get rid of the sensational press so you don't have that, uh, you know, we, we have been discussed, is it helping inflammations, is it taking away pain, etc. In the wrong hands, the message would be the FEI is sanctioning using painkillers for horses to compete. We know how easily that would be picked up, so it would need a major communication media effort and backed up by research, which is what this conference has been about, to say that this is being done in, in the welfare of the horse. And gentlemen from the World um, Horse Welfare Organization uh, was talking about the message that is going out to the, the rest of the equestrian uh, uh, public, you know, the all ride just from day in and day out, and people who are maybe making a living out of horses that in other as well as, you know, agriculture or wherever it is in the rest of the world, what sort of message is coming out by allowing it to be used. So if it were to be, I think we need to have a major media communication thing that will come out of it beforehand, before it comes out that it's been approved. Uh, can I just come in there quickly because I, I uh, would like to answer the question on behalf you asked about sponsors and for 11 years I've had the same sponsor, Hiscox, who are underwriters, not brokers, but underwriters and therefore accept the risk on many of the world's top sport horses and especially bloodstock which goes around the world and I pretty sure that they would say the, that they would want the same as me as as a, a rider that they want the best interest of the horse that that would want to be the uh, judgment behind uh, using something like this and i think they would prefer that to be in front of the best interest of the riders or the medals at that particular time especially as their money's in the horse I've, I've got one question for the panel, and that is, do you think in the future that we as a horse sport will need to have discipline Pacific regulations built into our medication control regulations? Um, this is certainly something that happens in WADA. Different sports prohibit different products. Um, do you think that is something that, that could, would, or should happen? Well, at some stage, we have to agree that all disciplines don't have the same uh, sequential type of, uh, of, um, of class and work and uh, exercise shipping. For sure, speaking about the short jumpers, these horses do something like uh, 50,000 miles per year, either by truck, plane, boat. Uh, we have to make sure that these horses uh, ship well, arrive in good condition, get a, a drip if they want to. So there is more support for such uh, discipline, I guess, than there would be for um, endurance, even though they need more support at the end of the race, I suppose. But by the time being, um, it, it could be maybe an idea that even if the, the rules, because I understand it's going to be very difficult to go by the NSAIDs according to the actual cost, according to the, the WADA, according to national rules, which are different countries to countries in Europe, especially uh, we had the example of Sweden, even if the welfare can be different as we uh, happen to hear today. Um, at some stage, I would like to make sure that the jumpers, short jumpers, maybe some dressage horses could have a little bit more support. This could be done on a case-by-case -case, uh, rule. As we arrive on the show, get to see the FEI vet, make sure that we can give the, this horse the appropriate treatment. So the point would be that definitely some discipline might need a different type of rule. Even though this might not be shown to the public, it will be just again done on a case-by-case. Um, exactly like they do on a human sport. I mean, in some sports, we never he hear about uh, doping problems, like uh, the tennis, for example. Even though um, I have met at uh, the recent games the, the French uh, doctor for the, uh, for the tennis team, and they have to say that they treat the guys during the competition. They treat the guy if he has, done a, he has a hard time uh, traveling as well. So we should be able at some stage to be able to do the same, in my opinion. And this is for the welfare of the horse. Uh, 
Again. Thank you. Anybody else have an opinion upon that question? John? Yeah. Sorry, Dermot Ford from Ireland, a veterinarian and horse owner. I think it's been a remarkably refreshing day, an educational day. And I think, first of all, we have the veterinary input for most of the day, and now we're getting the sporting input as well, and that's all very useful. Just in terms of putting things in perspective, I was interested to hear the gentleman from WADA today saying that their positive detection rate is, I think he said, just less than 2%, although looking at the slide, I thought it was about 1%. I've been involved with the MCP program as a testing vet since its inception in 2001, so this is the 20th year. When we started off, the detection rate, the positive rate was 6%. It's now down to 1%, inclu including NSAIDs, whereas with WADA, it's 1% or 2%, depending on the figure from the slide today, but not including NSAIDs. So we shouldn't be forlorn, and we shouldn't we f forget that we've made together enormous uh, progress in this regard. In relation to the... <clears throat> helping of horses on a Sunday night, traveling 10 hours through the night to rest on <coughs> excuse me, Monday and Tuesday and then be shipped to another show. I think with respect to Philippe and to Rodrigo, it's a little bit, if I might use the cliche, of putting the, the cart before the horse. Because surely what we should be looking at, and the FEI did promise to do this some years ago, is the number of starts that a horse is allowed in a, or the number of competitions per year. Rather than helping him travel, as I saw one time, a horse at midnight in Belfast in Ireland, and I met him again on Tuesday afternoon in a competition, or a warm-up competition in Geneva. I mean, that is incredible, to cross two seas and drive all that distance down. So I think that we should get our priorities right in relation to that regard. In relation to what I might call the Breeders' Cup Syndrome, uh, despite the figure of 15% of horses um, on NS, NSAIDs in the United States and in Canada, I think Yogi was correct when he talked about the more important competitions and the pressure that's on there to get medals and so on. And you'll know that every year in the United States in thoroughbred racing, they have the Breeders' Cup. And in Europe, it's not allowed for horses to, st to start on Lasix. But when the European horses go to the United States, Almost invariably, invariably, all of them, apart from horses of one top trainer, they run on Lasix for the very reason that Yogi outlined earlier on. I'm sure tomorrow that we'll talk about breeding and stallions and the value of stallions and the value of breeding values and how we can have breeding values objectively assessed when horses are being aided in competition by substances just such as NSAIDs um, escapes me. Finally, I'd just like to say that in relation to another aspect, and that is the Euro European Union law on the use of phenylbutazone and such products, such drugs. Everybody here is in the veterinary profession knows that you're not allowed to use these drugs without endorsing the passport and saying that this horse cannot be put into the food chain once you use such drugs in a horse. Now this might seem a bit irrelevant to a gathering such as this, talking about expensive sport horses, but lower down in the chain, especially in these recessionary times, there are lots of horses for whom the ultimate end may be, and thanks be to goodness it's there, an abattoir that's available to take them. But with the use of such drugs, that outlet is not available to such horses. Thank you. Thank you, Dermot, and a lot of those things you've mentioned are going to be dealt with tomorrow, so I think that's probably a very good point to draw a line under today, and to thank you all for your attendance. Uh, it's been a very interesting day for us all, uh, and I'd like to thank my panel for their input and for the effort they put into answering your questions. Thank you very much, panel.